President Trump established a new office in the White House to create partnerships between the government and faith-based groups. It's part of an executive order called the White House Faith and Opportunity Initiative that Trump signed today during a National Day of Prayer ceremony. We are proud of our religious heritage. And as president, I will always protect religious liberty. The Faith Initiative will help design new policies that recognize the vital role of faith in our families, our communities, and our great country. We take this step because we know that in solving the many, many problems and our great challenges, faith is more powerful than government and nothing is more powerful than God. Oh, I love that moment. Trump may often sound like the most pro-faith president in modern times, but oh gosh, there's still much to do. Here's to discuss Reverend Johnny Moore, spokesperson for the president's informal evangelical advisory group. Well, it was a, it was a hot day in the, uh, in, in, outside at the White House there. Uh, a lot of evangelical Christians, uh, it was, people were stunned, like, how do you guys support Donald Trump? I mean, look, married three times, you know, all the deals. Now it's Stormy Daniels. Why does this president speak to the evangelical base today, given what's happened? Well, to the religious liberty community, I mean, he's a total hero. That, that's, that's what he's done. I mean, this executive order this year was part two. You know, last year at this very national day of prayer, he ordered basically an audit of the entire federal government to determine every single example where religious liberty was being violated with the whole cabinet sitting there. And this year he's saying, you know, we've cleaned all that up. We, and, and, you know, there's a whistleblower element of this executive order. He's saying to the public, you see a problem, tell us about it. He's saying, oh, now we got all that settled. So how can we partner together as, as a faith community? You know, and doing it in the Rose Garden, steps out of the Oval Office was a powerful symbolic image. Yeah, symbolically. I mean, just seeing it, his words, he, if, in everything that's going on and swirling around him. Did, did any of you get together? Do you pray regularly with him? Uh, do you? Yeah, we, we, we pray with the administration. You know, all the time we pray with him, we pray with others. I mean, you know, the other day a reporter asked me, uh, is it true that there's like an evangelical in the White House every day? And I said, you know, it's probably like 25 every day, you know, and at least 10 or 12 of them in the mm -hmm. West Wing, and a bunch of them on the cabinet as well. I mean, this is a faith-friendly administration. And although they're he has a policy where their words are. Uh, well, although, you know, he said he was going to help the little sisters of the poor, contraception mandate, going to get rid of that. But it's not. We, they're still litigating that. Uh, so he hasn't given the release. I mean, look, Congress has to do some of this stuff. But couldn't he, with an executive order, address that issue and then probably head to the courts? Well, the fact is that the Obama administration had so uh, obsessively deconstructed religious liberty across the federal government. I mean, it took him a whole year to sort of untie all of this. You know, and I think the Little Sisters of the Poor are, are just, uh, you know, they're going to fight this to the, to the very end because they were taken advantage of. By, but they by want the President Trump to he's going he's to get in there and uh, make sure that, that that just doesn't happen, that they're mandating contraception coverage to these nuns. A, a, a hundred percent of the time president trump has demonstrated that he is entirely supportive of, of religious liberty he's the most pro-religious liberty president that we've had and you know I, I think when it's when it's all said and done as we've seen again and again and again the proof will be in the policy that's what it'll be you know and, and you know it is the national day of prayer too i mean this is amazing you know for eight years president obama had a private celebration he issued proclamations uh, this was a powerful ceremony. Uh, it's great to see you, and uh, we're praying right along with you guys today. Thanks great so much. To be here. And we'll close it out. Stay there. We'll be right back. That's all the time we have left tonight, but guess what? Ed Henry was at a charity event in New York, and guess who we ran into? Rudy Giuliani. He's going to tell Shannon what he found out in his conversation with Rudy. Up next, the Fox News at Night team is going to take it from here. All the new developments. Uh, of course, uh, the Mueller and the Cohen and the Rudy, and it goes on and on and on, Shannon. He does. News didn't break totally tonight before your show, but we thought we'd give you a little bit of a reprieve. Well, a we show. appreciate that, and we'll get that inside scoop from Ed coming up. Thank you so much, Laura. All right, take care. Fox News confirming tonight that President Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, was not wiretapped, but federal investigators did keep a register or a log of his phone calls. Tom Dupree joins us with legal analysis, and then... 
Jessica Tarlov and Jason Chaffetz debate the political fallout. And our very own Ed Henry with Rudy Giuliani tonight. We've got inside scoop on everything from his call for the attorney general to step in and his surprise revelation last night about that Stormy Daniels payment. Plus, tensions flaring with Beijing, the Pentagon accusing China of, of using lasers to injure two U.S. pilots over the skies of Africa. Hello, welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight, Giuliani's reportedly calling on Attorney General Jeff Sessions to step in on the Cohen investigation. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry just attended an event with the newest member of the president's legal team. What can you tell us, Ed? Well, Shannon, you're right. I was just with Rudy Giuliani a few moments ago at a 9-11 charity event, the uh, Tunnel to Towers uh, Foundation, and he was very uh, upfront about saying that he had another conversation with the president a few hours ago and that the president, despite all the media chatter about Giuliani having disastrous interviews, that the president is very happy with the pugnacious tone that Giuliani is pushing. In fact, Giuliani confided to me uh, that when one conversation with the president, the president joke that he's so pleased with Giuliani's performance, he's thinking about sending him to those talks with Kim Jong-un to try to work out uh, the, the uh, peace talks with North Korea because he likes the tough line that Giuliani is taking. Uh, remember, last night we talked about the president moving quickly from cooperation to confrontation with Special Counsel Robert Mueller and all of the other investigations on the Hill, the Michael Cohn probe. Uh, he's lead pit bull, basically, is attorney Rudy Giuliani. Tonight he's demanding, he mentioned it to me again, that Attorney General Jeff Sessions finally step up to the plate and shut down the Michael Cohen investigation, perhaps as a precursor to reining in Robert Mueller as well. All this kicked off today by an NBC News report that was basically wrong. Uh, they jumped the gun based on anonymous sources claiming that Cohen's phones were tapped by federal investigators in the weeks prior to those extraordinary FBI raids of his office and homes, and that there may have been at least one call, NBC claimed, with someone at the White House that was listened in on by investigators. Well, Giuliani had already shaken things up uh, last night by revealing right here on Fox that the president had reimbursed Cohen for the $130,000 payment to a porn star, jumped on this report to demand that Sessions put the investigators under investigation themselves for government overreach. Giuliani earlier telling the Hill newspaper this was a blatant disregard for attorney-client privilege. Quote, I am waiting for the attorney general to step in in his role as defender of justice and put these people under investigation. He added that when the president learns the extent of all of these tools He's going to say to me, isn't there an attorney-client privilege? And I'm going to tell him, no, the Department of Justice seems to want to trample all over the Constitution of the United States. Furious debate today about whether the president reimbursing Cohen for the payment was an illegal campaign contribution. Giuliani told me again, it is not a problem, they believe. And earlier on Fox and Friends, uh, he noted that Cohen was merely helping his client deal with what they still maintain the president uh, did not have, that he did not have this affair with Stormy Daniels and did not even know about the allegations during the campaign that basically, Giuliani says, Cohen acted on his own to make what they claim to be a false allegation, go away. Watch. Imagine if that came out on October 15th, 2016, sure. yeah, in the was. middle of the you know, last debate with Hillary right. Clinton. So to make it yeah. go away, they, they made this Cohen payment. didn't even ask. Uh, Cohen, didn't, Co Cohen made it go away. He did his job. How does Sarah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders go to work every day if she was sent out there to mislead the American people? I believe she, she said what she was told to say, and so somebody obviously wasn't telling the truth. Now, Sarah Sanders defended herself at the podium by saying she only learned of the president's payment last night from the Fox News Channel. She told reporters she gives the best information she has uh, at the time. And I want to tell you one other thing, uh, you know, about NBC News. They issued an editor's note saying three U.S. officials now dispute that Cohen's phones were tapped. And as you noted at the top, Fox News learning independently that Cohen was under surveillance but his calls were not listened to. One other point that Rudy Giuliani made to me. He said, Ed, it feels a little bit like when the Access Hollywood tape came out. You remember that in the heat of the campaign, the president in a lot of hot water had to apologize. A lot of his surrogates ran away, except one, Rudy Giuliani, who took the heat, went on television, was the pit bull, defended the president again and again. Rudy Giuliani told me tonight, it feels a little bit like that moment, the Access Hollywood moment. A lot of people criticizing the president, a lot of people thinking he's in desperate trouble. Rudy Giuliani Giuliani said, we're fighting back and fighting back hard. Shannon? Yeah, and just as he was then, uh, seems to be quite a confidant to the president, something he has wanted or needed with uh, respect to his legal team. So, Absolutely. Ed, thank you very Good much you. for all the inside scoop tonight.
All right, so what does it mean that investigators were tracking calls to and from Michael Cohen, the president's personal lawyer? Tom Dupree, former deputy assistant attorney general under President George W. Bush, joins us with some analysis. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you, Shannon. Okay, so let's talk about this because there was early in the day a report that it was wiretapping, that they were listening to his phone calls and maybe even his phone calls with the president. There were concerns about attorney-client privilege. Now what we're told is something called a pen register where they just look at the log of phone calls to and from, how long they lasted. Who would have had to approve that? Is it two different tracks or would they both have to go down the same track? They'd have to go down a similar track. To get something like this, you need approval both within the Department of Justice, in this case, I think at a fairly high level within the Department of Justice, and also a federal judge to sign off on it. What strikes me about this, Shannon, is even though we are finding out apparently that his actual conversations were not listened to, the fact that they are tracking who he's calling, who he's receiving calls from, is very anomalous in this context. These are investigatory tactics that you usually see when prosecutors are going after a drug baron or something like that. Extremely unusual to do it for a lawyer and unique to do it for the president's lawyer. Now, I talked to Judge Andrew Napolitano, our senior judicial analyst here earlier tonight, and he thinks they may have done more. Here's what he said. Do you really think the Justice Department is going to admit that they listened to phone calls from the president? They may not have recorded, but I assure you they were listening. If they were listening, they can't use anything they hear as a basis for an affidavit of probable cause or in a prosecution. But it can send them seeking other means to obtain evidence to support that. So we talked about this idea of parallel reconstruction, where if you find something you're not supposed to have access to, you then try to go find a legal way to get back to that same information. He thinks it's just his opinion that that may have happened here. It, you know, we're going to find out, I think, in the months ahead. And look, they are walking a fine line here. I mean, if there were people listening in on these calls and they found things out, I think the Justice Department is going to have to do a lot of work in order to effectively erase the taint of acting on information that arguably they shouldn't have accessed in the first place, if that's what they did. Okay, so last night we have Rudy Giuliani, the newest member of the legal team, talking about this payment uh, to Stormy Daniels and reimbursement to Michael Cohen. Uh, they there has been a lot of debate about whether or not that was the plan last night or if it became the plan in the middle of the interview. So the president tweeted out three very specific tweets, a very carefully worded, some um, legal uh, definitions and things used this morning. And part of one of those tweets, he said, um, despite already having signed a detailed letter admitting that there was no affair, he's referring to Stormy Daniels, he said, prior to the violation by Miss Clifford and her attorney, that NDA, this was a private agreement, money from the campaign or king, campaign comp contributions played no role in the transaction. So he's trying to say there was no campaign money here. Well, Norm Eisen tweets this, if Cohen loan was not one to campaign, then it was one to you, meaning to the president, and you omitted it from your personal federal financial disclosures for the period. That's a crime under 18 U.S.C. 1001, and we have filed a cr criminal complaint with DOJ. Norm Eisen is with crew. They file a lot of complaints with regard to politicians. What do you make of this? Because people are saying now, Giuliani did this to get him out of trouble with a potential campaign violation, but it could create another problem. Yeah, look, and, and first of all, I don't profess to know what the communication strategy here is. I mean, I think we've seen over the last few months, sometimes they might go in different directions. With regard to campaign violations, I will say a few things. Number one is that proving intent in these types of cases is extremely difficult. You basically have to show that the defendant not only did the act, but knew exactly what he was doing, and really an attempt to circumvent federal election law. And I think in this case, there's certainly evidence that it may have been carelessness as distinct from an effort to circumvent federal election law. In in this area, there is so much that is gray, that so much that has not actually been determined by the courts. And of course, the punishments can range from effectively a slap on the wrist to more serious criminal sanctions. So my guess is we haven't heard the last of this, but mm -hmm. bringing a prosecution based on these facts, in my opinion, would be a real challenge. Okay, so this is separate and apart. This Michael Cohen, a Southern District of New York federal case is different than what the Mueller investigation is doing. We got word today that Mueller has now requested 35 blank subpoenas or 35 sets, so 70 total blank subpoenas, dealing with the Manafort case. Um, there are a lot of folks who say, listen, that's just standard procedure. They would do that anyway. But they say in the way he's gone after Manafort and this referral on Cohen and some other things, they're being very heavy handed. This is a different kind of case. And they are very much targeted in making sure they, quote unquote, find something. Yeah, and, and look, I agree, first of all, that the subpoenas, I wouldn't read too much into that. That's fairly standard prosecutorial tactic of getting these blank subpoenas. I wouldn't read too much into that. I will say this, though. I think that what we have seen with Mueller, both as to Manafort and then, of course, the referral on the Cohen side, is an extremely aggressive prosecutor who's not afraid to play hardball. We talked earlier about how they're treating Michael Cohen as they almost would a drug lord. Same thing with Manafort. Mueller is determined to prosecute this thing aggressively, 
take no prisoners. And I think that people who are defending these clients in these situations need to appreciate that. Mueller is serious and he is playing mm -hmm. hardball. Yeah, it certainly looks like it. All right, Tom, always great to have your legal insights. Right. Thanks, Thanks for Shannon. stopping in. All right, as the special counsel investigation continues, Michael Caputo, a former campaign aide to President Trump, who met with the Mueller team yesterday, says special counsel investigators know more about what was happening in the Trump campaign than just about anybody. He says Mueller is still focused on Russia collusion, and he believes that his team has a specific objective. I think they, this is a punishment strategy. I think they want to destroy the president. They want to destroy his family. They want to destroy his businesses. They want to destroy his friends so that no billionaire in, let's say, 15 years wakes up and tells his wife, you know what, the country's broken and only I can fix it. His wife will say, are you crazy? Did you see what happened to Donald Trump and everybody around him? All right, let's discuss with our political panel, Fox News contributor Jessica Tarlov, who is also the senior director of research at Bustle.com, and Fox News contributor Jason Chaffetz, former Republican congressman from Utah. Welcome to you both. Hey, Shannon. Hey, Shannon. All right, so let's talk about this, because with Tom, we talked about the, the legal aspect. Let's talk with you guys about the political now, uh, because there are a lot of folks out there who say it just doesn't look good on a number of fronts. Caputo says he, he without using the words witch hunt, that's kind of how he portrayed what he went through in having this conversation with Mueller. Uh, Jessica, what do you make of it? I'm just surprised that there are so many people out there, even in Trump's orbit, that will make him seem like a complete victim. The idea that Bob Mueller is on this now one year plus wild goose hunt for no apparent reason except to make sure that no billionaires in the future wake up and say, oh, I'm going to save America is completely ludicrous. Listening to Mark Caputo, listening to Rudy Giuliani last night and this morning, it's not believable that there's nothing going on here when you consider that there are three separate category, categories here that Mueller is looking at, obstruction of justice, Russia collusion, and financial crimes as well. I think it does a disservice to the president, actually, and really eliminates any sympathy for his case besides with that core base that loves those tweets that just say witch hunt early in the morning to make it out as if he's a complete innocent here. Okay, let's play a little bit more of what Rudy Giuliani had to say last night. This is what he said about Mueller. A uh, patriot, an extraordinarily good man, Served his country. Served his country. Did a good job with the FBI. Uh, I don't think he, he would be affected by uh, malice or prejudice. However, I don't have an explanation for the people that he hired. Okay, so good things to say about Mueller, but let's look at this team that he's put together. And this is by what we publicly know about the attorneys who've been added to the team. None of the 16 lawyers known to work for special counsel Mueller are registered Republicans. There are 13 registered Democrats on the investigation, three lawyers with no party affiliation, and campaign finance records reveal that 11 of the lawyers have been Democratic donors. Jason. It does not seem uh, fair. It doesn't seem balanced. I, I think of all the people in the world that they can go out and pick, they couldn't find one that was, you know, as either a Republican donor. It just doesn't look doesn't look right, Shannon. The other thing, to, responding to Jessica, though, you're supposed to be pursuing something based on a probable cause. You look at the list of questions that came out earlier this week. It's everything under the sun. This is Donald Trump. This is your life, and we're going to investigate everybody everywhere. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. I do think they're off the rails. I think they they're they are out to destroy Donald Trump instead of pursuing a crime and then trying to figure out where the case leads them. And many of these things have absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump. They should be pursuing his his constitutional I should say the president should be pursuing his constitutional roles and responsibilities. He has a right to do these things instead of being questioned about his intent on why he would be doing his job and say firing director comey all right i want to quickly well, ask we've both had of so you, many different let me ask you uh, based on the legal team that we have and that's coming together emmett flood also joining the team very quickly do either of you think that the president sits down for a face-to-face -face with Mueller or his team uh, jessica first to you and then quickly to jason i don't think so and i think it would be a massive mistake if he did that jason uh, Donald Trump doesn't necessarily always listen to counsel. I think he does because he likes the optics. Oh. It's got to be narrow and focused, but he will sit down at some point for a limited set and hmm. he will answer those questions. That's a prediction, not okay. necessarily what I'd recommend. All right. Well, the two of you come back and we'll see if it happens. Uh, Jessica and Jason, <laughs> thank lot. you both very much.
Thanks, Chad. All right, breaking news on North Korea just ahead. We're tracking the three Americans held hostage by the rogue regime and the president making major news tonight about American forces stationed in the DMZ. We've got a live report. Plus, why is China threatening American military pilots? As tensions rise, there could be long-term consequences. We'll take a look at that. What's next? And a major bust in California. Almost 100 arrests, drugs, and illegal weapons seized. And the suspects, well, they crossed the border from Mexico. The Mexican mafia is reportedly on the loose in California. We'll have the facts when we return. This is a Fox News alert. We are awaiting word on the fate of three Christians held by North Korea amid significant new moves by the Trump administration involving U.S. forces in that region. This is all ahead of an anticipated summit with the North Korean leader. Trace Gallagher is tracking it all. He's got the very latest. Good evening, Trace. Good evening, Shannon. This is kind of a two steps forward, one step back kind of process. The president tweeted, quoting, the past administration has long been asking for three hostages to be released from a North Korean labor camp, but to no avail. Stay tuned. Then this morning on Fox and Friends, President Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, seemed to confirm the release was happening. Watch. This is the president of the United States. He's getting ready to negotiate probably one of our most historic agreements since the opening to China. With and Nixon another with Iran, perhaps. Yeah, and, and, we, and we got, we got uh, Kim Jong-un uh, impressed enough to be releasing three prisoners today. But later, the White House, State Department, and senior administration officials walked back Giuliani's statement saying there is no confirmation of the release and there was, quote, still work to do. Though relatives of one of the detained men say they are counting on a quick resolution, and South Korean media reports the three Americans have been moved from a labor camp to a hotel on the outskirts of Pyongyang. 59 year old Tony Kim was detained in April of last year just as he was about to leave the country. Kim worked at Pyongyang. Yang University of Science Technology and was accused of hostile acts against the regime. Kim Hak Song also worked at Pyongyang University and he too was accused of hostile acts. And in April of 2016, 62 year old Kim Dong Chul was sentenced to 10 years in prison for spying on behalf of South Korea. Meantime, there are other encouraging signs leading up to the meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong un. Today, South Korea's top national security advisor made another secret visit to the U.S. to meet with his counterpart, John Bolton. This is the very same South Korean official who came back to the U.S. in March to convey the news that Kim Jong-un wanted to meet face-to-face -face with President Trump. Details of today's meeting have not yet been released. And President Trump has reportedly ordered the Pentagon to draw up plans for drawing down U.S. troops in South Korea. Reducing troop levels is not a bargaining chip for the Summit, but officials say if there is a peace treaty, it would diminish the need for some 24,000 U.S. soldiers to stay on the Korean Peninsula. Shannon. All right. Trace Gallagher live in Los Angeles. Thank you. Well, U.S. officials are calling out the Chinese for harassing American flight crews in the skies over the African nation of Djibouti. The incidents involve high powered lasers. Jennifer Griffin reports from the Pentagon on the incidents that have left two U.S. airmen hurt. Jennifer. And in the Pentagon says there have been more than two, but fewer than 10 incidents recently involving Chinese military personnel pointing high powered lasers into the cockpits of U.S. military planes flying missions in Africa. They are very serious incidents. There have been two minor injuries. Um, this activity poses a, a true a threat to our airmen. We've raised concerns directly with the Chinese about this uh, and there will be near-term and long-term consequences. We have um, formally demarched the Chinese government um, and we've requested that the Chinese investigate uh, these, in these incidents. The Chinese opened their first overseas military base in Djibouti last summer, just next to the U.S. air base, which is home to a fleet of drones and U.S. warplanes. The problem is not limited to this Chinese base in Africa. On Wednesday, Marine Commandant General Robert Neller said Marine pilots in Japan are facing laser attacks as well. It would be helpful if the people that lived around there didn't uh, point lasers at our airplanes or fly kites or balloons into flight paths because that way we would have a better assurance that they would be safe. Look, we want everybody to be safe. 
Adding to the diplomatic tension between the U.S. and China, within the past 30 days, U.S. officials say the Chinese military has positioned anti-ship cruise missiles and surface-to-air missiles on three of their fortified outposts in the disputed Spratly Islands, islands that are claimed by six Pacific nations. China also added radar jamming equipment to the Spratlys recently as well. We've been very vocal about um, our concerns about them militarizing um, and these artificial islands. $3.4 trillion in trade passes through the South China Sea every year. Now China can strike any ship passing within 300 nautical miles of the Spratlys with these newly installed cruise missiles. Shannon? Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon for us. Thank you very much. This is the Fox News Alert now. Video just in from Beijing of the U.S. trade delegation during the second and likely final day of trade talks in China. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and Trade Advisors Peter Navarro and Robert Lighthizer are all there. Very high-level meeting face-to-face -face with the Chinese over a technology dispute that's taking the U.S. and China the closest they've ever come to a full-on trade war. Well, back here at home, a Texas teenager has been arrested and accused of planning an ISIS-inspired mass shooting at a shopping mall. 17-year-old Mateen Azizi Yarand was charged with making a terrorist threat. Officials say he planned to release a message to America explaining the attack and allegedly spent more than $1,400 buying weapons and tactical gear. Well, a major drug ring crackdown targeting the so-called Mexican mafia and their operations right here in the U.S., the culmination of a three-month investigation taking guns and drugs and dangerous criminals, 85 of them, off the streets. Casey Stiegel has details for us tonight. Casey. Well, Shannon, it was the largest crackdown on gang activity in the state of California so far this year. Take a look at these pictures. A huge cache of narcotics also seized 14 pounds of methamphetamine, to be exact. Three pounds of heroin happened in Orange County. That's south of Los Angeles. Deputies say they also found 36 firearms, two of which happened to be stolen. In all, 85 were arrested in this bust. And investigators say out of those 85 individuals, all are considered to be middle management leaders of the infamous criminal gang, the Mexican Mafia. A stark reminder, says Orange County's undersheriff, of how powerful the organization is here in the U.S. While these arrests and seizures are significant, they are just a drop in the bucket compared to the widespread control that the Mexican Mafia has over gang activity throughout Southern California. And as you also saw from those pictures there, a large amount of cash also seized a sizable dent there in California and here in the homeland. Shannon. Casey Stiegel, thank you. Stick around for a closer look at impeachment and how upstart Democrat candidates are trying to capitalize on left-wing fervor for the I word. Plus, a warning from a top Democrat strategist that the highly anticipated giant blue wave could be hitting a wall. Starwalt's here with the latest midterm power plays. Top Democrat leaders are discouraging talk about impeachment of President Trump. But many upstart challengers in the midterm primaries are not sticking with that party line. Doug McElway takes a look. What would our founding fathers want us to do about this president? I'm Tom Steyer. San Francisco billionaire and Democratic money man Tom Steyer lays out the case for impeachment of President Donald Trump in a $40 million ad campaign. He's garnered over 5 million signatures claiming Trump has, quote, brought us to the brink of nuclear war, obstructed justice, and taken money from foreign governments. In Washington, as late as January, the impeachment drumbeat was resonating among some members of the Democratic caucus, too. Resolved that Donald John Trump president of the United States is unfit to be president. 66 House members voted on that resolution, eight more than voted for impeachment the previous month. But with midterms lurking next November, the impeachment clamor is mostly quieting in D.C. The party hierarchy urging calm that impeachment talk is premature. Now, Mueller brings forth the clear evidence that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians I think you have grounds for impeachment. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi was more direct. Impeachment is not someplace that I think we should go. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer also urging patients, quote, you might blow your shot when it has a better chance of happening.
That thinking is exposing a rift in the party. An April Marist poll found 70% of Democratic voters would definitely vote for a congressional candidate who would move to impeach the president. Many Democratic candidates, like Minnesota Senate contender Richard Painter, hear that message loud and clear and are defying their leadership's caution. I think President Trump has demonstrated through his conduct and his rhetoric that he is unfit for office. California Senate candidate Kevin DeLeon, running against Senator Dianne Feinstein, is also pushing for impeachment, as is Texas Democrat Beto O'Rourke, vying for Republican Ted Cruz's Senate seat. So is Florida Democrat Mary Barzi Flores, running for the open house seat of retiring Republican Ileana ross Leighton. Republicans hope to benefit from the impeachment talk. The National Republican Senate Committee telling Fox News today, quote, that extreme rhetoric is going to have dire consequences for 2018 Senate Democrats up for re-election in states President Trump won. It's widely believed that the midterm momentum lies with Democrats, but the last thing they want to do is re-inspire the Republican base with impeachment attacks that many see as premature and unfair. Shannon? All right, Doug, thank you very much. So Republicans have been bracing for the so-called blue wave in this fall's midterm elections, but there are new warnings tonight for Democrats. So let's talk about it with Fox News Politics editor Chris Steyerwald, Ma'am. Fresh back from West Virginia. Fresh as a daisy. We can't believe that you came back. Well, and I'm sorry that I get I'm sorry that I gave my sons your pepperoni rolls, but they the said they were eat. delicious. They the said they were delicious. Eat. Well, I'm glad you have to feed your children. That's a priority over us, so Quite we get so. that. Okay, so let's talk about this new report out. This is by some Democratic strategists and pollsters and folks who have put this together saying that Democratic momentum has stalled in recent months because the party has failed to focus on the economic and health care battles that most engage anti-Trump voters and because Republican base voters, especially white working class men, could finally point to a signature conservative policy achievement in the new tax cut law. Does this mean the blue wave is really slowing down? No, I, I look, the, well, first of all, we should remember the Democratic pollsters and strategists who are making this argument are saying that because they that's the message they think mm -hmm. they're of a more moderate stri stripe. They think that's the right answer for them. Obviously, liberal Democrats think other things, and there's a debate going on within the party. I would say this. It's not so much that the Democratic momentum has stalled. It's that it wasn't ever quite as high, really, as it was uh, reputed to be. This is a climate. I'm sure that if the election for the House of Representatives was held today, it would be close. It would be very close. Um, but it has not been so far the kind of enormous blue wave that's 100 seats or 85 seats, a giant reversal. So what matters here, and I think this is a good takeaway for both parties from the advice of those pollsters, which is the policies you pursue, the things that you do will matter. The people who do vote in midterm elections pay close attention to what's going on. If you are bringing forward policies that people like, if you're doing things that voters think are a good idea, then it's a good thing. But to Doug McElway's point, the voters Democrats most need to win this election are moderate suburbanites, college-educated folks, former Republicans, or people who have Republican leanings. Democrats need to convince them that what all they want to be is a check on President Trump, not crusaders. Okay, a mini semi-lightning round. I want to okay. take you through um, a couple of things that could be beneficial to the base on one side or the other, or does okay. it motivate both sides? Let's talk about guns. Okay. Uh, because, you know, there are a number of, and we're going to talk about another segment coming up about Eric Swalwell, a Democratic member, who's right. saying, like, it's time to take away guns. Uh, who does that turn out to the polls? That's a, that's a uh, 40 percent, 20 and 20 on either side, super intensifier. We've seen all the money uh, that has been raised by the NRA. We see all of the organization that's taking place on the left side. You know, it's sort of like with Tom Steyer. He's not selling impeachment. He's selling, uh, please sign my list so that when I run for president in 2020, I have a ready-made organization. Mm -hmm. uh, something like guns helps organize so on both sides. So cynical. Oh, never in politics. Okay, so impeachment, but that's let's loop that in with this idea of uh, Nancy Pelosi, who says that she will once again be speaker. She says this, we will win, meaning the Democrats will retake the House. I will run for speaker. I feel confident about it, and my members do, too. The That's GOP has to love that, though. First of all, yeah, there are a number of people running Democrats who are saying, I'm not going to vote right. for her. I'm not throwing in with her just yet. Um, but I got to think the GOP likes that because uh, then immediately the next step is, well, hey, if she wins, you got Speaker Pelosi, you've got impeachment. So there's been no sanction so far for any Democrats who say they won't support her. Uh, it's been free reign and groups like Emily's List and other uh, groups on the left have said, we don't care if you're voting for Nancy Pelosi or not. I think the, the reality in Washington is 
Nancy Pelosi is not going to be the Democratic leader anymore. Uh, whether she is going to fail and be in minority again, or whether she's whether the Democrats are going to retake the majority, but I think it's highly unlikely that she's going to do it. The mm. question is, can can enough Democrats use that to their advantage and say, "I'm standing up against her. I'm going to vote against Nancy Pelosi," and that actually gives them uh, something that they can stand on. They can say, "I'm t I'm an independent-minded Democrat, and I'm tough, and I'm not just going to be a rubber stamp." In any case, if they retake the House, this talk of the I word is out there, it's and out either there. side can use that to their advantage. So. Exactly, and they All will. Right. All right, if you go to West Virginia this weekend. Pepperoni rolls. Pepperoni this rolls time, rolls I promise. I'll, br right. I'll bring back the whole bag. Good to see you. Okay, bye. All right, on this National Day of Prayer, drama in the House as the House chaplain withdraws his resignation. What Speaker Paul Ryan is saying about this controversy, all the twists and turns, we've got it for you tonight. And a prominent Democrat says it is time to get serious, as we talked about with Chris, about taking away your guns. Does his dramatic proposal prove the warnings by Second Amendment defenders and how could it impact the fall elections? We'll be live from Dallas on the eve of the NRA convention with Emily Miller, author of Emily Gets Her Gun. She's got answers coming up next. This is a Fox News alert. The embattled chaplain of the House of Representatives is withdrawing his resignation. In a two-page letter to House Speaker Paul Ryan, Reverend Patrick Conroy accuses Ryan's staff of forcing him out. Now, Ellison Barber has been following the story, and she has more on the National Day of Prayer as well, including the story of a convicted felon and his faith. So we'll get all of this together, the, the good and the redemptive. And right. So we'll Listen. start with Father uh, Pat Conroy. He unresigned today in a letter to House Speaker Paul Ryan, as you said, that he said he wants to finish his term as House chaplain, writing in part, quote, I have never been disciplined nor reprimanded, nor have I ever heard a complaint about my ministry during my time as House chaplain. He goes on to say Ryan never spoke with him about resigning. The Speaker's chief of staff delivered the message telling Conroy the Speaker was asking for his resignation. Conroy writes, quote, I inquired as to whether or not it was for cause. And Mr. Burks mentioned dismissively something like maybe it's time that we had a chaplain that wasn't Catholic. He also mentioned my November prayer. Prayer. That prayer he's referring to is one that some saw as critical of tax reform. Ryan says he's accepted the letter and decided that Father Conroy will stay as House chaplain. In a statement, Ryan claims his initial decision, quote, was based on my duty to ensure that the House has the kind of pastoral services that it deserves. Democratic Congressman Joe Crowley is calling for a select committee to look into the events leading up to Conroy's initial dismissal. All of this, as many across the United States paused to observe the National Day of Prayer. As is tradition, the president issued a national National proclamation. He then spoke in the Rose Garden. President Trump wasn't alone there. And there's one person in particular we think you should know about. At events like this, it's normal for people to pay more attention to clout. The president, the vice president, the leaders of the free world. But the person who perhaps deserved the most attention doesn't control the nuclear codes. John Ponder from Las Vegas. Get up here, John. John Ponder from Las Vegas, Nevada. Fox 5 News at 10. In Las Vegas, many know him. Convicted felons released from prison return to life behind bars at an alarming rate. Maybe not surprising since they offer to the same communities or activities that took them there in the first place. So changing those patterns takes work and it takes support. That's where a Valley nonprofit comes in. Ponder, the story goes, spent years in and out of jail, landing in federal prison before he was 40 on charges related to bank robbery. In jail, he found faith. In part, there's a peace and a fulfillment because he heard the late Billy Graham. Today, Ponder stood in the Rose Garden next to the FBI agent who helped put him in jail. John, do you like him? I love him. The leader of a rehabilitation nonprofit called Hope for Prisoners. We provide those supportive services. A man who, according to local reports, has taught over 1,500 ex offenders skills that are necessary to successfully re enter the workforce, society, and their lives at home. John Ponder from Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, that was a great part of the ceremony today to see we all need redemption and forgiveness at some point in our lives. So great to see he's now doing uh, mm. so much to help others. Thank you very much, Ellison. Yeah.
All right, Congressman Eric Swalwell, a Democrat from the San Francisco Bay Area, has a solution for gun violence. He's writing this in an op-ed. He says, quote, we should ban possession of military-style semi-automatic assault weapons. We should buy back such weapons from all those who choose to abide by the law. And we should criminally prosecute any who choose to defy it by keeping their weapons. The ban would not apply to law enforcement agencies or shooting clubs. All right, we're joined now by Emily Miller, author of Emily Gets Her Gun. She's a political strategist and an expert on gun control policies and crime. She's in Dallas at the NRA convention where President Trump is scheduled to address the event tomorrow. Emily, great to have you with us. What do you make of that plan? Because it sounds a lot like confiscation. It is exactly confiscation. And I hope that Congressman goes personally to check everybody's house in America to see if they have an AR-15. That'll go over real well. Yeah, uh, you know, and, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's ridiculous. Like, you can't, we don't have a national registry. This is not mm -hmm. Hitler. This is not Cuba. We don't have a national registry. We don't know who owns these guns. And I can promise you, as a gun owner, and coming here from, at, I'm here speaking at the NRA to uh, tens of thousands of other proud gun owners and supporters of the Second Amendment, they are not going to turn in their AR 15s. Okay, so let me and talk you know, to you about a really important point. It, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying, I want to talk to you about some polling that we have because we saw a real spike in those who thought we need tougher gun control laws in this country. Of course, after the Parkland event, it was tragic. There were young people who were lost. Now, there are young people who are out there advocating. They've gotten a lot of attention. Um, that has dropped off some, like it always does after the events and a little time goes by. But still, 56% of people say they do support tougher gun laws. 39% say they'd oppose them. What do you make of those numbers? Those are the newest. Well, obviously, uh, um, these rare mass shootings, like what happened at Parkland and what happened at Sandy Hook years ago as well, what happened at Sutherland Springs Church here in Texas, they're rare. It's generally on average, and this is government figures, you can look this up, Congressional Research Service, less than 50 people a year on average. The last year has been bad. It's been horrific. We've had Las Vegas, we've had Parkland, we've had these really terrible tragedies. Um, there are, they were lone wolves. They're not terrorists. This is not inner city crime. You know, of the 10 or 11,000 people a year killed by, killed by guns, homicide by guns, about 300 total are by rifles. So. The issue really on gun violence is inner city gun violence and handguns. And but why that's don't you think not that what you're hearing from Yeah, why don't you think that gets talked about more? Do you think the president will address that tomorrow? I don't know if he's going to get into the details. You know, he's a big picture kind of guy um, of, of gun crime and, and, and that kind of stuff. But what I th it doesn't get talked about because the left gets energized. And you heard Chris talk about this a minute ago. The left is energized by the idea of getting all our guns. It, they love the idea. They talk about, they bring up gun violence, you will hear Australia. To the point where I had to mute the word Australia on my Twitter feed because I couldn't stand mm. to listen to it anymore. We are not going to confiscate all the guns in America. It's never going to happen. Yeah. So, we, have, this is the Second Amendment, we have a Second Amendment in the Constitution that says we have the individual right from God to defend ourselves, which the Supreme Court has interpreted, which you know better than I do, Shannon, the Supreme Court decisions in Heller, who yeah. I saw tonight here in, in Dallas, Dick Heller, mm -hmm. that the individual has the right to own a gun and to keep it at home. Yeah, well, interesting. So that enough, Congressman's idea is going nowhere. Well, and part of what he had to say is that they've been too nice when it comes to the Second Amendment, and it's time for him and other Democrats and folks who uh, believe it is time to control guns more to stop being so nice about the Second Amendment. We'll still see that. We know that's not happening where you are, Emily, in Dallas at the uh, NRA convention. We'll watch to see what the president has to say. Thanks for the preview. Thanks for having me. All right, this is one Twitter feud you got to see to believe. Senator Marco Rubio and former White House intern, the most famous one, Monica Lewinsky, battling it out on social media. The Real News Roundup, next.